Well, good afternoon, Frolics. I can't believe we're here today in this Zoom tasticness, this webinar um, connecting across the province and perhaps even beyond um, to think about our practice, um, to engage with colleagues, and to think about the potential of English First Peoples 10 to 12 and what that can mean for our practice, for our students, and dare I even say, for our province in terms of um, disassembling some long-standing practices that perhaps even five years ago we didn't we didn't even really think about as being problematic and how really the work of our colleagues who have been leading the way in um, English First Peoples um, 10 to 12 have really laid some incredible groundwork to help us all um, work towards decolonizing our practice and really think about literacy practices in a much more rich powerful and equity oriented way. My name is Leighton Schnellert, and I am your co-host for today, along with my colleague, Tammy Renyard. I am a professor at UBC, and I my, my specialty or my focus is rural education, and so I just want to acknowledge our partners in this work. We have the Edith Lando Virtual Learning Center at UBC, where I work, and they are recording for us. And about a week or 10 days from now, you'll receive an email with a link to the recording. So if you'd like to watch it again or share it with colleagues or share it with your department or your staff meeting, you're welcome to do so. I mentioned the Rural Education Advisory, which is made up of rural leaders from across the province, recognizing and celebrating the uniqueness and contributions of rural communities, rural children, and the land itself. We're delighted this year that the BC Teachers of English Language Arts are co-sponsoring as well. The Greater Victoria School District, I'm gonna let um, Tammy speak in a moment and they've been um, the original partners in this work. And so thank you, Tammy, um, for that vision that you have. Um, and finally, we just wanna mention and acknowledge the province of British Columbia through the Minister of Education um, is also supporting us in this project. And we are just so delighted that collaborative work is happening so that we too bring our voices and our organizations together to make change. And so I'll pass to my colleague, Tammy. Good afternoon, everyone. I just wanna say thank you for being here. We know weather is uh, changing all over the place and that sometimes after the end of the day, it's hard to, to stick around to engage in these powerful conversations. And I just wanna say thank you to our guests today um, for being part of the learning journey with us. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I am on the traditional territories of the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, the Lekwungen speaking people. And with deep gratitude, um, we look at this topic today because I think as we begin to do this work in a more systemic way in our province, I think it's really uh, powerful for all children to see themselves in the work in our districts. And so I'm really excited to see so many folks from our district and from around the province here today. So I will turn it back to Leighton, thank you. Great. Uh, I live and I research um, and I collaborate with elders on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Seel, um, the Okanagan people. Um, I live in, in this territory as a settler guest um, and I recognize the seal as the rightful caretakers of this territory. And so um, I want to honor and celebrate um, the stewardship that they continue to engage in, but also the generosity of inviting me to learn and support me in learning local seal ways of knowing and be being, including an alchemy and how the knowledge system is connected to the land and the people and inseparable. And I have come to understand that in Silchen, the language of the seal, um, and since Silchen, the language of the Sinaiics, our neighboring um, nation, um, there are no words that have to do with land or nature that don't also have an aspect of them that include the people. And there are no words for the people or people that don't also include connections to and aspects of the land. And so this interrelatedness you'll see is a theme today and how grateful am I to spend time on the land with elders learning and thinking about how literacy is grounded in place and the potential of how our identities, all of our identities as humans are literate identities that can continue to grow when we recognize what we have, who we are, what we can be, and that everyone in all of our diversity bring something to be celebrated, learned from, and that can push us forward in our understanding of ourselves in the world. I'm going to pass now to our um, 
first guest speaker. Da, 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 da. Um, um, Denise Augustine, I'm just so del delighted that you're willing to come and join us today. I realize you had a many things on your plate this weekend because you and I are in a meeting together on Saturday. Um, but Denise, if it wasn't for you and Tammy, Tammy and I were all working together about 20 years ago, you know, I would not know the potential of what's possible um, in so many ways for so many kids. And so um, we're delighted in your new role as the superintendent of Indigenous education for the province um, that you are continuing to collaborate with educators around practice and helping us think about what we can do, who we are, um, and what's possible. So I'll pass the torch now to Denise. Good day, everybody. It, it fills my heart with good feelings to be here with you. My Hokkaminam name is Sweelt. I um, hail from many places, but from Shemana's First Nation. And I identify as a First Nations woman of mixed ancestry. My mother is Jane Marston, Kwatlamat. I'm the granddaughter of Edith Sylvie. And I carry the name of my great grandmother, Sweelt, who is also known as Alice Alec. It is my privilege, as Leighton said, to serve as, as the superintendent of Indigenous education for the province. And, and what that means is I get to travel around and have really rich conversations with folks who, like you, are stepping into sometimes places they're familiar, some places that they're learning, and doing that with courage and all for the, for the benefit of our, our children who are here today and those yet to come. So please know that it's, uh, thank you. It's with gratitude that I have this privilege of spending a little bit of time with you. I um, come from a family of storytellers, uh, rich, uh, skilled, wise leaders. And um, I wanna tell you just a little story to start us off. Then I'm gonna provide a little bit of, of hopefully, um, provocation and encouragement for doing the work that I understand you all are stepping into doing that. And, um, and then I have a couple of little resources to share with you because I, I know that as my time as an educator, time felt well spent if I had something I could use the next day or share with my colleagues. So hopefully I'll leave you with a couple of those things too. But that's a lot to pack into 13 minutes. So here we go. First of all, I wanna tell you a story um, a memory of when I was about 12. It was a hot summer and um, I come from a big family. I'm the oldest of seven. I have lots of aunties and uncles. And my grandma had been over the last few years driving by one particular spot in Shimanas, the area that I grew up that had been recently cleared, watching the blackberries go, grow, getting ready for the blackberry harvest. This was the year, I was 12 years old, we drove in, it was a hot, hot summer day. And um, I was once again delegated to look after the little ones. And I so badly wanted to be a blackberry picker. So grandma gave me a can, one of the big coffee cans with two holes punctured in it with a string around my neck and gave me the chance to um, try to be a blackberry picker again, because I had tried this in the past. And it was, it wasn't very long, I think it was about 15 or 20 minutes, and she came over and checked my bucket and said, um, yeah, you're not picking blackberries, off you go look at the, look after the little ones again. And this is sort of a, a theme that came came through my life, and, and, um, and I was never allowed to pick blackberries. Still to this day, I'm a terrible berry picker. I will find other ways to support whoever the berry pickers are. So I just invite you to hold on to that story. Maybe you have a connection that you're making and, and, uh, and, and in the way of um, our community, my community, um, it is an invitation. If there's something there that means something to you, great. If not, let it go and, and maybe it'll come back to you again another time when you need it. So as I said, I come from a rich family of storytellers. You might know some of them, I'm a Marston. If you want to Google Marston and, and Coast Salish art, you'll, you'll see some of my family. One of my brothers is as a, a big piece of art on the side of the ferry that travels between Galliano and Vancouver, the, the Salish Eagle. My brother Luke has um, a piece in the government house. John's got a piece in the international airport. 
um, I have the, the huge privilege of, as I travel around this area, seeing my family represented wherever I go. And, um, and I, as I was preparing to share with you today, I couldn't help but think about the words of um, um, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, who talks about the danger of a single story. And the reason I bring that up is because as you're, as you're stepping into the work of teaching um, First Peoples English and other courses, um, I want to just ha have you hold on to that idea of the danger of a, of a single story. And what I'm referencing is everywhere I go, um, I continue to see people who are excited about sharing what they've learned about residential school, but perhaps have stopped their learning there. I can't help but think of my mom's words. Uh, so my mom looks like, Tammy can verify this, a little Indian, Indian lady. She's short and round and cheeks and black hair. And, and she, she said to me, Denise, um, I don't need people to feel sorry for me. I need them to get the heck out of my way. And so, and with that comes that story of, um, I don't need to be saved. I don't need folks to heal me. I need to have space that my ways of knowing and being are recognized and valued. One of the things that comes from teaching First Peoples is the opportunity to share some of those stories. When you talk about me, I don't want you to only talk about the story of residential school because me and my family, we are so much more than that. Given this time right now where Western science is looking to indigenous sciences to solve the problems of the world, this becomes particularly relevant. Let's, when I think about, oh, Tammy, when was it? It was like 2006 or something when, when we started teaching and digging into the, the to first people's English at that time. And we were so excited to receive all these texts and, and to do the learning, there was a group of us. And, um, and since that time, the courses have been available. And I, I, would, I was trying to find the number for you all, but if you're interested, I'll happily find it. Something like, Five, since those courses were created and became available, 5% of the students in BC have taken one of those courses. So folks will ask me, Denise, you know, why, I don't think we should force people to take extra credits or to take this course. Uh, we should just wait, you know, we're, we're generating this interest. And, and I would respectfully push back. We've been waiting a long time. And here's the thing, this is a fantastic opportunity to share with, with kids and your colleagues and to learn on your, uh, on your own behalf about the rich, positive, diverse um, strengths that are represented in texts uh, that represent First Nations peoples. What we need to be careful of is that it's not just um, the text. So, so I would also invite you to think about this. I still peek my head into English classes and I gotta say, they, they still look quite a bit the same as when I went to school. There's often rich dialogue, there's some uh, rich debate, um, uh, engaging texts that students are, are um, involved in, they're writing essays, maybe there's some partner discussion. But what if I pose this for you? As you learn to incorporate indigenous worldviews and perspectives, what if that also means an English class doesn't look the same as it did when I went to high school? If we are integrating Indigenous worldviews or First Nations worldviews and perspectives, um, one of the things that will happen is that you will be a learner alongside your students. And 
For some, it'll mean centering or amplifying work that you've already been doing, that we've already been doing. For other of us, it'll mean that we're stepping into places that we're, we're less familiar with. And, and that's all okay. What's really important is coming to it with that sense of humility and drive to learn more. I have many First Nations, Métis and Inuit colleagues, friends, family members around the province. And we are alive to the danger of putting our chachas manam, our sacred children in classes where they're, the teacher is teaching this content who maybe has not done the work. And so they're being assigned to teach First Peoples English and they'll go through the motions, but their eyes are rolling, they're making little jabs. Um, we're alive to that danger. And we're moving forward because this is important. I would add, I know that collectively we can do this. And it does require that we hold each other up, that we link our arms together and we support each other as we, as we move through. Um, there are a couple of tools that will be helpful. Um, I'm going to play just the first two minutes of a video. I'm curious if you're familiar with the Professional Standard 9, Truth and Reconciliation, um, moving forward. So if you are already watched this video, you can take a two minute break. I'm just gonna try to play two minutes of it because it's actually a really good resource, especially if you have colleagues that you're trying to um, just coach or walk alongside in their journey. This is a requirement that all of us pick up this work, that we do so with integrity. It's important for us as educators, and myself included, to think about what has shaped my perspectives, my values, and by knowing the past and knowing the influences, and then perhaps helping me understand my own bias. So that by doing that critical self-examination, then I as an educator can help the learners do the same thing. Professional standards guide and advance the work of educators in our province, communicating knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values, as well as our responsibility to contribute towards truth, reconciliation, and healing, acknowledging the history and contributions of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis in Canada. In 2019, Standard 9 is the unprecedented commitment of BC educators to truth, reconciliation, and healing, ensuring all students have the opportunity to learn Indigenous perspectives throughout all subjects. The creation of Standard 9 was very important to address the First Peoples principle of learning, as well as to address more diversity, equity, and inclusion in our system. Standard 9 sends a strong and positive message that educators play an important role in responding to the needs of First Nations, Métis and Inuit learners, families and communities, creating systemic change in BC schools and supporting improved outcomes to advance reconciliation. I think it's really important for educators to, to think of it as kind of a learning journey. It is a very exciting time in the educational system where Indigenous perspectives are now a part of the curriculum at each grade level and subject area. Um, thank you for that. So it, for me, as a First Nations woman, as a grandma, it is so exciting to know that uh, First Nations worldviews, perspectives, knowledges will be um, shared and celebrated in, in classrooms across BC. Um, so, so this is part of the reason I show up to you today with such, such gratitude. Um, folks, we're not gonna get it perfect. We are going to stumble along the way. So please don't do this alone. You have this 
already the beginning of a network here, find a couple of colleagues and do this work together. Um, remain humble and curious, just respect, remain humble and curious. And then uh, let's celebrate uh, First Nations of BC. Um, and, and in doing so, we're gonna learn more about ourselves, about who we are in this community, and more importantly, about how to be really good neighbors to each other. And to me that when I think about my little grandbaby Nova, that she might grow up and, and be seen and celebrated as much as her other classmates, that, that, is, a, that is the future that I know we can create. Um, I am going to share one more little two minute clip. And this is another little, it's a little bit of a fun fact that in, some of you may not know, November 28th to I think it's December 2nd is Vancouver Fashion Week. And um, I, what I wanna introduce you though to is the BC Achievement Foundation um, because they have many little two minute videos highlighting indigenous people who are successful, however you wanna define that. And there's all kinds of definition of success. Um, and I just think this is, again, a, such a great reminder that you and I carry the story of residential school and we carry the stories of so much more. At Vancouver Fashion Week this past spring, I Lalem showcased their first collection. Designed by sisters Annalie and Sophia, it featured artwork by their father, William Good, and brother, Joel, of the Snunamooks First Nation. They were inspired by their mom, Sandra, a painter and design mentor. Their fusion of traditional First Nations art with sleek modern fashion and eco-friendly fabrics captured the crowd at the show. People love it. People love the fact that we make clothing here. People love the fact that they're eco-friendly. Mm -hmm. Then they have traditional artwork. They're made by a family. Natural, breathable fibers. People like that, yeah. Oh, I was so happy. I was too happy to be proud at the time, you know. <laughs> they come to it naturally. When they were kids, their whole family lived in an art studio where William carved, their mother Sandra painted, and the kids absorbed. Always being creative. We were always creative. Brother was producing pottery, paintings, candles, uh, learning how to carve buff jewelry, paint. <laughs> so to us, family time mm -hmm. is um, art time. And I guess when you're creating art, it doesn't feel like work. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons they work so well together today. We've been raised to work together, so we work very well together. I think just growing up in the art studio and always being allowed to be creative, and in creative in your own way as well as in a collective. All right, thank you for that. So you can just Google it and you'll find, and there are so many great, well, uh, great, mm, beautifully creative videos that will introduce you to some of the folks that I hope all of us learn who they are and what they're doing to help create a beautiful world today. So that that's I think that's it for me. Um, thank you to each and every one of you for coming on this journey. Uh, I will, as I light my candle this evening, as I've been taught, I will call on the ancestors to stand beside you as you walk bravely into creating a future that is beautiful and hopeful for our children and for the planet. Thank you, Denise. What a beautiful opening. You challenge us and you support us at the same time. Thank you. Um, I'm very excited to introduce Emma Milliken. Emma, I'm going to get your new title incorrect, so I'm going to let you share your title. Uh, I love learning alongside Emma. We met this morning for some work we're doing in our district, and I'm just, it's just so amazing to see how you are leading this work that you've been living for a long time. So it's with uh, deep gratitude that um, we have you here today to share with the province. So over to you, Emma. Miigwech, uh, thank you so much, Tammy and Leighton. Um, thank you, Denise, um, for that, um, all those wonderful words. 
Uh, Bojo, hello, Emma Millican and Dishnikaz, Makwa Dodem, Wikwidong, Ontario, and Donjba. I'm Emma Millican. I am um, Anishinaabe on my dad's side. I'm Bear Clan uh, from the Kettle and Stony Point First Nation um, on Lake Huron, and Scottish on my mom's side. Um, and I've been the, I'm, I'm, as Tammy was saying, I've changed roles this year. So I'm currently the Indigenous, uh, Indigenous teacher consultant for District 61, um, secondary level. Uh, and I, before that, I taught at Spectrum Community School uh, as an English teacher and as an ind Indigenous support teacher there for 17 years. So um, it's been a, a big change for me this year, uh, but an, a really exciting one. So um, I am have been living on the Lekwungen territories here of the Sankeys and Esquimalt nations for about 25 years um, and just daily grateful to be here. Um, really grateful as well to be, to have the privilege of teaching and learning from um, our Lekwungen uh, families and children um, and, and all the other children that live on Lekwungen territory as well and their families. So it's, uh, you know, really, I'm grateful daily for the privilege of being able to do this work. Um, I began when I started teaching, I was just thinking about this as Denise was speaking and listening to her stories. When, as I began teaching, um, I was just, I was an English teacher and, um, and a teacher, um, you know, it went to Nipissing University for my teaching degree in Ontario and um, learned kind of how to teach from a very Western perspective. Um, didn't go right into teaching. I could have been hired right into a full-time classroom when I, um, when I graduated because there was a teacher shortage. And uh, I didn't because I, I just felt like it, I wanted to do something different. I knew that for me, education felt different. Um, and so I taught for a year at, as a teacher um, at a, a wilderness school in Tomogamy, Ontario. Um, so, and eventually found my way out west here and, um, and did um, end up in the uh, IA department here, which was, which was amazing. Um, but as I've been teaching some of these courses, so as an English teacher, and I've also taught um, the BC First Nation Studies 12, that's what it used to be, um, uh, and then some of the First Peoples English courses, or all of the First Peoples English courses, um, pretty much, um, it's really only in the last number of years when I've been able to teach these First Peoples courses that I've felt, I guess, brave enough and um, strong enough to be able to, to teach these courses in kind of a different way and to feel like, oh, I can do these things. I can make the classroom and what I'm doing look different and it's okay. Um, so that's, I think, a really important part of um, what we're doing with these courses is that they were built to be taught differently. Um, and I know that for non-Indigenous teachers, because I have like a good number of colleagues at, um, especially from Spectrum, but around the district, um, I know that to step into these courses when you're not Indigenous, um, to be asked to be, look, to be looking at the world and looking at the resources and everything you're teaching through a different lens than maybe is your own, um, can be daunting and is not an easy ask. Um, but it's what we've asked our Indigenous students to do for, you know, for a long, long time is to, is to take on a different worldview. And so I'm, it's exciting to see uh, this change coming. Um, and so I thought it might be uh, helpful for non-Indigenous teachers especially, but also in Indigenous teachers, because, you know, even me approaching this work, I had to unlearn a lot of things. I had to unlearn how to teach things from a Western perspective and feel like that was okay. Um, so what I've, I just wanted to share um, with you some of the, the big ideas that you'll find as you get into the resources, as you get into the work, um, some big ideas and big themes that you'll find that com commonly come up in a lot of the, the work that you're going to be looking at. And just as you're doing your own work, um, learning how to look through an Indigenous lens, um, these are maybe some ideas to hang on to and to help ground you because I know that sometimes teaching, especially something new, it feels like a huge moving body of water. It feels like a great big ocean or a giant lake and you can feel a little, um, you know, like you can't find your footing. Um, so that's where I wanted to um, show you. So stones to stand on. So this was just me trying to put together some ideas and some uh, common themes that I think um, you, will hope, you, you will probably find. 
Um, there are definitely more I mean, uh, big ideas, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, these aren't the only four, but I narrowed it down for today's purposes, just to these, these really stand out for me. Um, and you could use these as ideas as you're teaching, um, but it's also for you as you're working through some of the, um, some of the ideas and some of the resources you're gonna be uh, using, um, just to hang on to these and think about them and reflect on them, um, because these are quite essential to most indigenous worldviews. Um, there's not, I just wanted to say, there's not one all encompassing indigenous worldview. Definitely they are all the same. Um, there are many, many nations all across Turtle Island. So I don't wanna make it sound like there's one, but there are definitely commonalities uh, that are rooted in relationship. And so that's to land, to story, to responsibility, and to connection. Those are four I thought might be helpful to, to look at today. Um, and if you use this framework, um, it will help connect you to the content and result in a much richer teaching and learning. So to not take the resources for these courses and then just still look at them through a Western lens, but to try and, and at least, if not completely shift, um, to at least expand your worldview to start to include um, how these fit into, into a worldview. And always the student is at the, at the beginning, or not at the beginning, at the center of the circle. Um, so that's something that I remind myself of and I think is so important to um, an Indigenous worldview and to teaching. I know we all feel this too, um, but just to, I spend a lot of time talking to my students about this. Um, what, where are you in this learning? Um, how does this affect you and your life and your strengths and your gifts with what we're doing in class today, um, making that, that learning meaningful and mean something for, for the students. And I do that very explicitly and talk about that a lot. Um, it also helps them to be responsible for their own learning, which I think is, is very, very important. Um, I wanted to highlight some, um, some resources as well for you. Uh, I don't know, some of you I'm sure will, will maybe know about this one. This is called Be a Good Ancestor by Leona Prince and Gabrielle Prince, illustrated by Carla Joseph. It's a children's picture book, but it, um, and I use these all the time in my English courses. I lean quite heavily on our uh, children's picture books because the stories tend to be short. They're usually very beautifully illustrated and they are just, you can pull so much out of them. Um, they're simple, but they introduce more complex topics and materials beautifully. Um, so uh, this would be one to definitely try to find it. Um, it's, um, it's just recently been released, so it's, def it's out there. Um, and it just ties all of these ideas about how to be a good ancestor, how um, your learning impacts your life and how you fit into the world. And so it would be good for you to ground your own learning as a teacher. Um, I read it, I've been reading it a number of times and just to use in your classrooms. Um, super, super awesome resource. Uh, land is super important. Um, any, I think, Indigenous focused course that you're teaching, um, it really things come right back to the land. Um, I know Eric is going to be talking about land specifically, so I won't take too much time. I want to um, I'll let her can talk to you more about it, but just that to highlight that the land for in, Indigenous people, Indigenous worldview is the basis of everything. And you'll find that in so many of the resources that you're using that a lot, most of them at some point come back to the land. Um, they are, the land is part of our family. Um, we are all related. Um, all parts of the land. And the land includes not just the soil you're standing on, but that idea that includes every, everything from the water to the air, to the stones, to the thunder and lightning and everything in between. Um, it's that's all part of our relatives and it's all connected. Um, so just to try and get, get your, your heads around that and understanding um, as, you're, as you're experiencing all the resources and um, as you're working through the course, to keep coming back to the land. My, I know I, the students, I think by the end of my course last, last June were, sometimes they would just laugh because you know, it's like, oh, and what are we coming back to? Oh, yeah, oh, it's the land, it's the land again. Like they, they totally got it. And they, they, it wasn't just about being the land, but they understood the richness of what that actually meant too. Or I think most of them, so it, was, it was interesting to watch that happen. Um, so another one to help you, a resource to help you with this and to use in your classrooms. Uh, this one, again, is hot off the presses, um, braiding sweetgrass. Some of you may have um, read the, the original version, which is written more for adults, just been uh, adapted by Minnie Gray Smith. Um, and it's a wonderful resource. I know it seems, sounds a bit sciencey, and you definitely could be used in science classrooms, but you could use pieces of this in English classrooms. I definitely would do that. 
because it helps, it really talks about worldview. It talks about the difference between Western and indigenous worldviews and has just beautiful stories in it. It's just so well done. Um, I would I would definitely run out and um, try and find this one or find this one and um, just start to use it, read it. It's a nice, easy read. It reads beautifully. Um, so this would be one I'd really look at getting. Um, and then again, Eric is going to talk about this, but just ways to get uh, bring the the land um, kind of to life on your um, in your classroom. Um, really, getting outside is a big piece of it, but not just to, to be outside, but also to have people come in and and shift that worldview for you when you out when you're out there. If you can have guest speakers come in um, who know who are local and know about the land and can share teachings and knowledge. It's amazing how even with a one or two sessions with somebody, you start to see a shift in, in how that thinking and relationship with land um, happens. So there are a number of ways to, to start to have that relationship with land that's maybe a little bit different from what people are used to. Uh, story is another one, uh, another big idea. And again, here are some of our amazing celebrated storytellers. There are just so many. Uh, Thomas King, Monique Gray Smith, Richard Wagamese, Leanne Simpson. I use her poetry a lot in my classes. Um, oh, shoot. And now um, Deanna, Rosanna Deerchild, um, The Unreserved, um, like the podcast on CBC. We do a lot of podcasting. Um, so it's a way to hear story. Um, and Lindsay Delarond in the middle there uh, is a wonderful storyteller in this area. So she's been into my class and, and done some storytelling with my students. Um, so she's fantastic. But there are just so many amazing uh, stories. And they we spend time too just looking at what story is, what does story look like? What are what do we use stories for? Um, and you know, this quote from Thomas King that the truth about stories is that's all we are. Um, also really looking at um, the fact that story isn't just something that's written in a book. So it's everything from oral storytelling to songs. I, I do drumming, so I, I bring the drum into my classroom and we look at songs, we look at um, artwork. I've had artists come in and we take, like we, we do art in the class and we look at art and talk about how that's story. Um, so looking outside of the sort of the box of what story is, also really important talking about how powerful story is. And so um, who holds the power of story? Whose stories are being told? Whose stories are being listened to? Um, how do you know when you're, you're hearing an authentic indigenous voice? So going through all of those pieces is really, really um, interesting and important, I think, in a class. This book, Dreaming an Indian, um, I've used a number of times in my classes, super accessible visual um it's it's got all sorts of like photographs and drawings and um, but also excerpts so like easy to grab pieces from it and then you can either um, just sort of use it as a launching off point for um for more complex uh, materials because the, the it's usually like a page or two um per kind of idea but really really great the students love this book just because it's so visual and so beautiful so just as an example in this book is a piece of artwork by Christy Belcourt, who's an, a Métis artist. Um, and she has this little story about a spider who came onto her painting and didn't wanna leave and it stayed there for four days. And she finally put it right into the painting. Um, there it's, she's got these little spider webs that she ended up painting into her piece of art. And so just the stories around the art, the story you can pull from the art, uh, so I've had students look at the artwork and create their own stories out of it. So um, it's just so rich and so um, it's just so wonderful to be able to highlight um, who these people are and what they're doing. And again, classrooms connection, classroom connections. I just really like to center this in students' lives by saying, what is your story? Uh, your voices matter, your stories matter. Um, and saying that over and over because sometimes Students haven't heard that a lot, or they don't believe it. You know, uh, being a teenager, you don't always believe these things. So, uh, finding ways to have students express their stories and support them in that um, is really fun. Uh, responsibility is another big uh, topic that we lots and lots of our resources and our uh, um, our text and our everything that we're doing comes back to responsibility. Um, just about how we have responsibilities and it's important to honor them. It's important to understand what they are. 
Um, and what happens when our systems of responsibility don't work, when, they, when somebody doesn't fulfill their responsibilities, what happens? Uh, the effects of colonization, run, that, that theme runs through quite a bit of the resources that are out there, um, and just how the responsibility is foundational to reconciliation. It's everybody's responsibility, and we're going through this together, and what, so what is your responsibility around reconciliation? Um, another book uh, to highlight is Urban Tribes, uh, again, by the same editors as Dreaming in Indian by Lisa Charlie Boy and Mary Beth Leatherdale. Uh, they've done a couple of books like this. So super accessible, highlights contemporary young uh, urban uh, voices specifically. And Mob Bounce is one of the, um, the these young uh, rap and electronic musicians, but also they incorporate indigenous um, indigenous pieces and an indigenous view into their music. So um, they're, they're amazing. And they apparently um, will come and do workshops. Uh, they're in BC and they, um, you know, they'll come and work with youth. So uh, they talk a lot about responsibility. So uh, they're super cool. All right. Um, and just to highlight quickly, um, they're in your classroom. I try to build in responsibility in everything from when you're in circle, what is your responsibility? When we're on a walk or a field trip or we have a guest speaker, what is the responsibility? What, what is your responsibility in those, in those roles? Uh, and I try to create assessment and classroom conduct together with students so that they have a sense of, of not just owning it, but also that I have a piece of this and I have a responsibility um, in this. And lastly, connection. Um, again, that, that idea that we are all connected. Um, that comes back over and over. Um, seeing ourselves in relationship with everything else creates that circular worldview uh, where everyone has a role in helping, learning, teaching, and listening. And it's, uh, we, we are all connected. So um, to highlight uh, a resource I've used around this, Nadia Kwandabens, this is really fun, um, has a Concrete Indian series. Uh, so she's done a whole series of these uh, photographs where she takes pe uh, Indigenous people um, and they're in either regalia or a piece of regalia, a piece of something that's traditional for them. And then she puts them into these very urban settings and takes and photographs them in there. This one is an installation. This photo is an installation in at Ryerson University right now. It's huge. Um, so it's, um, and that's so why I've had students um, go through the series and ended up creating uh, an essay out of it um, after they got a chance to work with some of the images and talk about what was happening. Um, and again, it's about walking in those two worlds, connecting to your traditional uh, culture, to your family, your history, and then also connecting to the modern world and you know, to the, the city, to maybe not being on reserve, if that's where you've grown up even, uh, maybe you don't spend all your time there. So connection in different places um, is super, super um, a, a big theme that we talk about a lot. And then I just try to connect, um, do lots of connections in my classroom. So. Um, Everything from our weekly circles to daily check-ins, uh, introductions, how to introduce yourself, how to connect yourself to where you are and to each other so we know who each other is and your families are. And then using phrases like all my relations, new um, I think every nation pretty much has a, a way of saying this, a way of expressing that um, we are all connected or a connection to something. Um, and so use them. Uh, Chief Robert Joseph's new book, uh, Numwayot, is, um, is, is all about this. We are all one. Um, so I think that is kind of it. Uh, I know I was talking really fast there. I was trying to get through it all. This is just, just to sum up, um, this, this was just uh, a walk I took the other day. I walked my dog early in the morning, and this is just around the uh, cul-de-sac near my house. I took a picture of the sunrise because when I find when I'm getting overwhelmed a bit or just tired or trying to you know figure out how am I going to put this all together and do the work I have to do because the work we're doing is big work. This work is important and it's big when we're talking about Indigenous education and Indigenous children, especially right now, um, but all children, of course, um, it's big work. So I find huge comfort in the sunset. Um, I when I'm watching it, I get a sense of time that it's. The sun has been coming up and going down for so many years. Um, it comforts me. And so I feel like the sunrise is gradual, far reaching and consistent. And our work can be like this too. And our children are always worth the work. 
So um, again, I hope you step into this work with excitement and with um, with with humbleness and gratitude. And you know, I I make mistakes all the time too. I don't do this work perfectly. Um, I'm always learning. So please, like, um, just to echo what Denise was saying, um, you you aren't alone in this. Um, I think we are stronger by working together. Um, and so I just want to leave you with that. Uh, Thank you, Emma. I am delighted to introduce our next colleague who's going to share her practice. Um, I've had the great fortune to work with Erica for quite some time. Um, I can't believe Erica agreed to do this. I'm sure she's still preparing text messages to me around how did you do that? Um, but Erica, your humility and your practice in working with kids, your transformative approach so that colleagues all over the district are coming to your door and just saying, what are you trying? Um, I, I cannot appreciate how much um, your work has made a difference um, quietly and powerfully and empowered so many learners in your school to find their voices. And we're grateful that you're willing to share your practice with us today. Erica teaches at, we call it Maggie, Princess Margaret Secondary in Penticton School District 67 on Seal Territory, home of the Penticton Indian Band. Hi, thank you, Leighton, for that very kind introduction. Um, so like Leighton mentioned, I'm on the unceded uh, territory of the Seal Folk Noggin people. And this is my eighth year teaching English First Peoples 10 and 12. And um, I wanna start by building off of um, something Denise said about doing the work. Um, I think I've prided myself on doing the work. So when I started uh, teaching this course and I was lucky to co-teach it my first year with uh, a colleague who did a ton of work to get this course started at Maggie. Um, so I got to team teach with her the first year and then she left for a different role. But when I started this course, I knew almost nothing. Um, I'm kind of ashamed to admit that I have a history degree and I, I didn't even learn anything about residential schools in my history degree. So I was already a, a teacher, but I'm a prolific reader and I've learned a ton from my students who are excited to share my guest speakers. And um, I'm always learning. I found I um, just recently finished braiding sweetgrass and I'm just always and I'm doing my master's right now with Leighton, who convinced me to be here today. Um, and I'm just always trying to expand my learning. So um, I wanted to kind of show you uh, a, a series of lessons from my class uh, that I think kind of build on some of the themes that uh, Emma set us up with. So thank you for that. And um, I'm hoping for Denise, what's to build on something Denise said, I, I hope my English class does not look like uh, the classes you have always seen um, since you were in high school. All right, so um, back when I first started this course, uh, I used to hear a lot of things like what you see on my screen. Um, some people assuming it was an easier version of English. Uh, I, in my course, do a field trip a week. I'm um, very privileged to have access to a 24, hour, uh, 24 passenger minibus and I got my class four license. Um, so I do a field trip a week, but a lot of people would question how I could teach all the English skills I needed to do when I do a field trip a week. And then I had some people saying, you know, it's less rigorous than regular English. And um, some students were reluctant to take the course because of very unfounded and preconceived stereotypes. Um, but I'm proud to say today that uh, English First Peoples is much more popular than regular English at our school. More students take it than regular English. And last year, um, we had a grad class of like 120 kids and less than 25 of them graduated without taking English First Peoples 10 or 12 or both. Um, and I think we've re I've really worked on changing this attitude. So I uh, wanted to show a series of lessons and I chose this one because it does end in an academic piece of writing. So I kind of wanted to show how to build to that and some of the advantages of using land-based learning to um, end it, well, to work towards a piece of uh, you know, regular English writing that you would do. In this case, my, um, we're doing a traditional essay. Um, but the lesson uh, focused around the significance of animals in First Nations cultures. 
So I wanted to start with a little story of uh, one day when I did this lesson, just to kind of show some of the powerful things that came out of it. Um, so in the land-based learning piece, we went to a farm. And um, I had a student coming up to me the day we were supposed to leave and she was having uh, an a full on panic attack, actually. She was crying um, and she was saying to me, I'm gonna fail math, I don't know what to do. Um, if I fail, I'm not gonna graduate. I think I need to stay behind and study for my math test. And usually I'm, I try to be very serious about all the field trips because as they are one fifth of the course in the end, I want the kids to see that they're a, a regular class like anything else. Um, but on that day, I could tell that she was fully melting down. So I said to her, you know, if you feel you really need to stay, I'll let you. But honestly, I think if you go, you're going, you're going to feel better. And um, she did go on the field trip that day. She came to the farm and um, actually the majority of the time she spent uh, brushing a horse. And when she got on the bus at the end of the trip, she said to me, she said, you know, you're right. Um, I feel a lot better. I feel calmer. And I actually feel like I can go back to school and write my math test after lunch. And, you know, this class is gonna help kids become better writers, better thinkers, but it's also gonna help them be more well-rounded people. And it's going to help them to learn um, one way of controlling their anxiety is by connecting with the land. And that has been, um, I've heard that comment on more than one field trip, kids telling me, you know, I didn't feel great when we were leaving the school, but after being on the land for a whole class, I feel so much better coming back. So the lesson started um, with a quote from Forest Stories by Kiele Namolo, um, which was an article given to me by Leighton. Um, and the, the quote centers around how um, colonial, one impact of colonialism is it created a hierarchy um, in North America where anim humans were at the top, animals were below that, uh, and the land was below that. And um, this may be one impact of colonialism that students haven't thought about before. Um, but as we, as uh, Evan mentioned, you know, that's uh, First Nations cultures. Uh, see animals and humans as all the same. And so I get them to think about that. And then the next thing we did was a sharing circle. I wanted students to connect in. Um, the majority of my students are non-Indigenous. And so I always am trying to get them to think about how can they connect to this knowledge? Where can they start? And then they can build from there. Um, so we started with a sharing circle where kids um, shared, uh, and this is one we're doing outside on that particular day, um, what role do animals play in your life and what benefits have you seen from a, having a relationship with an animal? And the um, thing I love about sharing circles uh, is it gives us a chance to connect as a class, build community, um, learn more about something that we're then gonna be talking about in class. Um, and I try to have them once a week because it really does help us connect as a class and build the community. Uh, then we uh, followed it up. I had a guest speaker come in. It was a local seal hunter. And he came in and he talked about, he shared with us some of the um, protocols that surround hunting, uh, at least in his family. Um, and he shared with us that it's different in different families. Um, but he came in and shared his family's protocols. And what was interesting about it is we had been harvesting um, some mountain tea, as you can see in the pictures, we were harvesting on the land uh, just a couple weeks before that. And we had had a guest speaker on that trip as well, who had shared um, harvesting practices with us. And the kids were interested in how um, similar hunting protocols and harvesting practices were. And it kind of demonstrated to them and that all parts of the lands are really treated equally with respect and they could see that. Uh, one cool comment from that day, I had a student put her hand up and she said to our hunter, she said, you know, I'm a vegetarian and I, because I don't like how animals are treated. Um, but she said, um, like it when in a traditional factory and she said, but, uh, I, you know, she's like, I might not have felt that way if I actually knew people treated animals like you do. And so she, I thought that was kind of a neat comment that she made. And so, yeah, we had a guest speaker come in. And then um, we kind of went from there. I got them to kind of think about um, Western cultures and how they view animals. 
and starting to get students to think about, um, I think Denise mentioned uh, acknowledging uh, how Western science is starting to bring in Indigenous knowledge and use that. Um, I wanted them to kind of see that with the way we treat animals and how uh, in, I think in Western cultures, we're starting to see benefits from interactions with animals beyond a commercial purpose. Uh, so I used these two videos, one's on just on pet therapy, and then the other one is on a program at UBCO um, that is uh, being used to help um, students with exa exam anxiety, um, so bringing in dogs to help them with that. And so we use these videos just to talk about what can animals teach us? Um, how can, can we have a relationship with a wild animal as well as domesticated ones? And then I got them to think about if they could see any of the protocols we learned from the day before um, with our guest speaker in the videos. If they could see any, why? If they couldn't, why not? Um, just trying to get them to make connections between um, some of the things we'd already been looking at. Uh, from there, we followed it up with uh, two texts, two in, um, Indigenous texts, actually First Nations texts. Uh, so one is from um, a collection of short stories by Richard Wagamese. It was called A Kindred Spirit. And it was about uh, the summer he spent when he was a kid on a farm with a horse that was considered unrideable. And then the other text we looked at uh, was one called Horses Important to Cultural Healing. And it was from uh, the SAS Culture website. And it was about a Cree community that was um, using a program where students engaged with learning about um, taking care of horses and it helped them connect with their culture. Uh, a lot of these kids um, were in foster care, and so this program was attempting to help them learn more about their culture and connect with them. And so uh, we read these texts, and these are the two texts that will become um, the academic piece of writing. We did a synthesis uh, essay with these two texts, um, and I gave them the topic that day, but before we wrote it, I wanted them to have a land-based experience. Um, so the next day we went uh, out to uh, a friend's farm and um, one of the final lines in the Richard Wagamese story is we heal each other with kindness, gentleness and respect. Animals teach us that. And so on the bus before kids got off, um, I shared that quote with them again and I said, I want you to think today, um, Richard Wagamese clearly valued animals as teachers. So what do you think? Um, reflect today as you interact with animals. So this farm had a variety, everything from goats to horses, to guinea pigs, uh, cats, dogs, there were Dalmatian puppies there once, um, all, all sorts of animal pigs. Um, I recognize again that I, I have, I'm privileged to be able to take my kids on a bus, um, but I think you could do even the same at a, your local SPCA. Uh, maybe you could get kids to bring in their own pets and have an experience that way but I was lucky to bring them out to a farm. So um, I wanted them to uh, relate back to what we had been learning about animals in Silk's culture and what we'd learned from the hunter and the articles we'd read and then the ones on pet therapy. So I asked them to kind of think about all that. Uh, the owner of the farm spent a few minutes just explaining to us about how animals has helped her throughout her own life and with her own mental health challenges. And then we just let the students interact with the animals for about an hour. So uh, there's a few pictures from that, uh, well, actually from a couple trips, but uh, what I love about it and what I notice every time we're out there is just uh, all the smiles and how happy kids are when we're out there on the land and they're touching animals. And um, I'm one of the ones with the puppy up on the top there. <laughs> a kid's like, I have to take a picture of you. You just look so happy. <laughs> I'm like, well, how many people get paid to hold out, you know, cute puppies for an hour? <laughs> so. uh, on the way back, um, because we had a 20 minute drive and Actually, coming back from any field trip, I always have them do a reflection. I'm always trying to help them understand that land-based learning is on the same plane as every single thing that we do. And so um, I had them connect back to the stories we read the day before and thinking about the essay topic that was coming up, which I'll show you in the next slide. Um, their own response to being with animals and how it made them feel, because that has a lot to do with the essay topic we're doing. Um, 
any strategies they use to calm themselves when they're stressed, because we've been talking about that the last few days. And then at the same time, so this lesson was in the midst of a lit circle unit. So we were also reading novels at the same time. So I had them connect it to the main character in their novel and their own connection with animals. Um, and so if you wanna see some of the lit circle books they were reading, these are some of the, I've done this lesson both with grade 10 and grade 12. With grade 12s, I tend to do it at the beginning of the course because it's a, a good essay topic that, to teach them a few skills with the grade 10s. It's a good one at the end of the course if they're ready for a more challenging piece. Um, but uh, here's some of the lit circle novels in grade 10 that they had choices from. And here's some of the ones in grade 12 that they got to choose from. I have a lot of kids tell me, they're like, there's too many good choices. I wanna read everything. <laughs> Um, I pulled out a few uh, reflections from um, student reflections from uh, last year, so I thought I'd share them with you. Um, the first one is the story I shared with you already that she felt that the animals put her in a better head headspace to face her math test. Uh, another student said that she felt like the animals not only had a positive impact on her, but she felt more connected to her peers because she saw everybody so happy that day. And she said, um, when I asked uh, the student about this a little later, she said she knew there had been some kids struggling before we went on that trip and it just made her happy to see them happy. Um, and another student said, I don't have a pet. So the last few days have been hard for me to connect. Um, this trip helped me feel what we'd been talking and reading about and what the guest speaker had been saying over the last few days. So I appreciated that comment as well. Okay. And I kind of, um, I liked this trip too, of the chance to learn a little bit more and talk a bit more about social emotional learning, right? Like how, I just want to make them more aware of some strategies in their life, uh, you know, moving forward out of high school to help them deal with uh, stress and anxiety. Um, and so on the fourth day, uh, this was the in-class synthesis essay we did. Um, so they had two choices. Uh, both of them were using uh, a kindred spirit and animals important to cultural healing. And um, what I loved about this is now we're on day four and no kid had a hard time getting started on this assignment um, because they had felt this over the last few days. So even though they weren't, you know, this is a formal essay, they weren't supposed to write about their own opinion in there. They're supposed to talk about the text we had been reading. They could do it because they felt what the authors um, were trying to explain in their pieces. Uh, I also just wanted to kind of draw your attention to um, this uh, lesson I feel fits probably pretty much all of the first people's principles of learning, but I thought I'd show you a few ways how. Um, so learning supports the well-being of the self, the family, and the community. Well, a lot of this lesson focused on strategies for calming anxiety. Uh, learning is experiential um, and relationship are based on relationships and reciprocal relationships. Well, the relationship was with the animal, with each other, uh, allowed them to personally feel what the video speakers, texts were all saying. And it made the writing piece easier because they could connect their own experiences with what they were reading about. Uh, learning recognizes that some knowledge is sacred. We had a hunter share um, Okanagan hunting pro or his family's hunting protocols. Uh, so those were shared by a knowledge keeper. Um, learning involves recognizing the consequences of one's own actions. Um, I've heard many quick kids say they felt they really had to like calm themselves in order for the animals to want to come near them. Um, so they had to really control their feelings and behave uh, and behavior. Uh, learning recognizes the role of Indigenous knowledge, uh, like guest speaker, all the texts we were reading um, had to do, or were by Indigenous authors, all the lit circle books we were reading were by Indigenous authors. Uh, learning involves patience and time. This was a four-day lesson. It wasn't one that we just did all in one day. Um, we built it over four days, uh, as well as you know, previously in the course when we've been learning about harvesting protocols and other things. Um, learning uh, requires the exploration of one's identity. Um, well, kids were always being asked to kind of connect in with their own thoughts, their own feelings, their own strategies throughout the lesson. Um, as I mentioned, uh, this is just one of 
about 18 to 20 field uh, experiences that we were on in this course. So I thought I'd just share a few other um, land-based learning examples from my class. Um, so I just put kind of the right, and they all ended in writing in some way, whether that was creative writing or poetry or uh, a paragraph or um, some of them built on concepts to help them understand the novels we were reading better. Uh, thanks, Leighton, and thanks everyone who's here today and has shared. Um, this course has meant so much to me. I have loved teaching it. Um, it makes me so excited to come to work every day, and I'm so glad that so many people are going to be starting to teach it and hopefully get that same experience as well. Thank you, Erica, for sharing your practice with us. Um, how can you use land-based experiences to enhance literacy learning? Whether you're in a classroom right now, you're collaborating with others, um, you're in a leadership role. Um, our challenge to you today is to recognize land as teacher, land as equal, land as pedagogy, and the incredible potential of understanding land as academic literacy. Colleagues, thank you for this incredible um, work that you're doing, coming together to share your practice in a collective way um, by engaging in this work in this way, stepping into our discomfort um, and supporting each other to do this work. We are doing the work of decolonization by welcoming local Indigenous ways of knowing into our context and Indigenous texts from everywhere. I'm so excited about the work and look forward to the next session with Dr. Sarah Florence Davidson, where we'll focus on story.